Welcome back. Now we're going to talk about part B of our functional anatomy of prokaryotic cells. The learning structure or learning objectives for the structure, we're going to start here in looking at things that are internal to the cell wall, and we're going to start with the plasma membrane. When we talk about the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, we see in the picture here that the membranes are in gold. The inner one is a phospholipid bilayer, that's the plasma membrane. The purplish layer in between is the peptidoglycan cell wall that we've talked about previously. And in this picture, this is obviously a RAM negative since it has a outer membrane in what we have in the diagram. To the lower left-hand corner, we see a blow-up of the plasma membrane. You see that it's a phospholipid bilayer. That means that it has the circular polar heads, and in between those are the nonpolar or hydrophobic fatty acid tails. So things to get across the membrane have to gain entrance. So in looking at the cartoon over to the side, you see that's one of the major functions trying to prevent things from getting across that membrane. And you have to be either the right size, the right charge to be able to get across. Embedded in that phospholipid bilayer membrane are a lot of proteins. Some of these proteins are referred to as integral proteins. That means that they're embedded in the membrane. And these are going to run completely through the membrane. Other proteins are considered peripheral proteins. They may associate with the integral proteins. They could be involved in cell signaling if they're to the outside of the cell. Maybe they're involved in being a receptor or something, but these are going to be embedded or in close proximity to things embedded in that membrane. So the really weird thing about the plasma membrane is that it's basically the viscosity of olive oil. And that's pretty amazing if you think about that cells are being held together by something that's just kind of this thick fluid. So that's why we refer to the dynamics of the membrane as the fluid mosaic model. Those proteins actually move. They can move from side to side and turn around. If you have something that maybe is a receptor, it may bind to something from the outside of the cell and then cluster together other proteins to be involved in signal transduction. So it's very important that things can move throughout the membrane. The phospholipids themselves, they can actually rotate and move. They can do this laterally and spin around in places, but they can't flip-flop. The phospholipid the polar heads to the outside of the cell are different than the polar heads to the inside. So the membrane always maintains that polarity of what's the outer boundary and what's the inner boundary. As I said, the major function of the plasma membrane is that selective permeability. Things that are large and charged, like proteins, don't get across. Things that are small and uncharged, like simple sugars or amino acids, those are going to be more easily able to get across. And because like dissolves like, we also see lipid-soluble substances can pass more easily through the membrane. This is very important as we're thinking about making things like antibiotics or other types of therapies or things to kill the cell, trying to get them inside, is that we have to get across this cell membrane barrier. But not only is it a barrier, there's also a number of enzymes for ATP production that are embedded in the cell membrane. And this is going to house what is referred to as the electron transport chain, the ETC. And we'll talk about the electron transport chain in chapter five when we take a look at metabolism. For the most part, if you're designing a antibiotic or something to inhibit a bacteria, damaging the membrane is probably not gonna be the first target you think about because there's not a lot of difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic membranes. So therefore, things that damage the membranes, things like alcohols and quaternary ammonias, which are detergents, 
polymyxin antibiotics that you find in things like Neosporin. These all are going to puncture holes and cause the bacterial cells to leak. But the problem is that these are also capable of damaging eukaryotic membranes. That's why right now in the time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, when you're using a lot of hand sanitizer, you know that the alcohol dries out your skin and it's killing a lot of your skin cells, but skin cells regenerate so quickly, it's not a problem. But in general, these types of agents that target the cell membrane are only going to be for topical use. I'll be honest here, I'm not really that great at photosynthetic organisms. If you take a look at any of the plants in my office, they're not doing so great. However, here's a little sidebar on photosynthetic pigments that are called the chromatophores. These are foldings that we see that are derived from the cell membrane. So in photosynthetic cells, yes, bacteria, there are some bacteria that are photosynthetic. They are going to have these chromatophores. So you can see in the picture there that these are right at the edge of where the cell membrane would be. They contain pigments used to capture light energy for producing sugar in photosynthesis. Just another interesting story is that when we were first trying to understand what the inside of cells look like, we would use freeze fracturing and things to prepare cells for the electron microscopy. At one time, people found these infoldings that are referred to as these mesosomes, and people thought they were a real structure, that these were where cell division began. We now have come to note that these mesosomes really are only an artifact of the process of preparing things for the electron microscope. So they're not really a functional organelle, but if you look at some of the older literature, it will talk about these mesosomes. So now we're gonna talk about the boundary and what gets across. So looking at movement across a membrane, we need to talk about things that are passive diffusion. So simple diffusion, you can think of this from something like taking a dye pellet and dropping it into a beaker of water. The dye is obviously going to fuse away from the pellet as it dissolves in the liquid, but this is actually simple diffusion where the dye is following its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration, that pellet of the dye, to an area of low concentration, the rest of that beaker of water. So that just happens. Everything goes from a area of high concentration to low concentration, naturally going down their concentration gradient. So now if you think of simple diffusion and just add a membrane in, we see molecules are still going to get across the membrane by going down their concentration gradient from areas from high to low. So we see in the figure that things that are small and uncharged, they may be able to just simply diffuse across that membrane. In facilitative or facilitated diffusion, the same principle occurs. Things are going from areas of high concentration to low concentration, but they can't get across the membrane. They may be large, too large and charged to get across, so they need some help. The help is in the form of a transporter protein, what we refer to as a permease, and these transporter proteins are going to allow things to go down their natural concentration gradient passively, but they need help to get across that barrier of the cell membrane. So this passive process can either be use or use a nonspecific transporter or permease. And that just means that you have something of a channel. It's a protein channel that allows things to pass through, but you can also have channels that are more specific. So a specific transporter is going to be more like a lock and key. It's going to fit a specific molecule that needs to be transported across the membrane. In this case, we're looking at a glucose molecule. And so therefore, as that specific transporter, 
recognizes that that molecule is in the house, it is then going to open the gate and help to shunt or shuttle that molecule across the membrane. So these are going to be things that just can't naturally get across the membrane. So diffusion is always going to eventually reach equilibrium. We can do an experiment where we put a membrane, something that has small pores in it, and we can put, for example, dye, and we see here in the top panels, a gold dye, and starting out on the left-hand side of the membrane. And if we place that membrane in water, we see that the dye molecules begin to diffuse across the membrane if the pore size is appropriate to allow them to cross. At some point, the dye is going to reach equilibrium. It's going to have equal number of dye molecules on the left-hand side as the right-hand side. So that makes sense. But the thing that people often don't understand is that each substance has its own concentration gradient. So it can only balance against itself. So yes, everything's going to go from higher to lower concentration, but it's only going to balance against itself. So in the bottom panels here, we see we have the purple dye molecules on the left-hand side and the gold dye molecules on the right-hand side. So the purple dye molecules, they're going to go down their concentration gradient and diffuse from left to right until they reach equilibrium with six purple dye molecules on each side of the membrane. And the gold molecules, they're going to follow their concentration gradient going from high to low, but they're going to go, in this case, in the opposite direction because they're going to follow their concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium with three gold on each side of the membrane. So you can't just balance dye molecule with dye molecule. It's purple dye molecules have to balance each other and the gold ones have to balance each other as well. So if we think of this in more biological substances, we can see glucose can only balance against glucose and something like sucrose can only balance against sucrose. So you can't mix and match. Everything's gonna follow its own concentration gradient. We can talk about the solutes like dye molecules and sugars and things, but oftentimes those things can't get across a membrane very easily. So we start to see, we usually talk more about the diffusion of water. So osmosis is again, this passive movement of water and it is going to follow its concentration gradient from high to low, the same as what we talked about for the solutes. The equilibrium is going to be referred to as when we reach that, that spot where we no longer have net movement or loss or gain across the membrane. That's referred to as osmotic pressure, the pressure needed to stop the movement of the water across that membrane. In a simple experiment, we see here that we have a membrane, a cellophane, cellophane sac, and inside we have put sucrose. The sucrose molecules are going to be in high concentration, and there's very little water inside the sac. If we then place that into a beaker of water, there's lots of molecules of water to the outside of that sac of sucrose. Therefore, the water molecules are gonna rush into the bag and they're going to keep doing so until they reach equilibrium. So in this experiment, the bag is probably gonna start out a little shriveled up because it's got all this high density sucrose inside. Then as you place it in the beaker of water, all that water is gonna start rushing in and the bag is going to swell and it's going to swell to the point that it reaches equilibrium. It's not that water isn't still moving, but there's no net gain or loss. It's always going to be counterbalanced so that it's reached its equilibrium point. Water is obviously very important for all cells. So osmosis is the passive movement of water across the membrane, 
going again down its concentration gradient. But this actually is going to occur in two ways. So we do have a lot of simple diffusion where the water molecules can, without any help, just simply diffuse across the membrane. However, we have also realized that there's what's referred to as aquaporins that allow bulk flow. So these aquaporins are actually protein channels that just get more water across. They actually act like a pipe so that it allows lots of water to get uh, into the cells or out of the cells as needed. So this isn't too surprising since water obviously is the universal solvent and so important for any cell, whether it's bacterial or a eukaryotic cell. So when we talk about the principles of osmosis, we can also think about when things are not in equilibrium. So a isotonic solution is going to be 0.85% sodium chloride, but we can also talk about isotonic from regards to other molecules besides salt. But if we look in the panel here, we see in this first panel an isotonic environment. So in an isotonic environment, the number of solutes outside the cell is at the same concentration of solutes inside the cell. So there's no net movement of water. Again, water is going through the membrane, but there's no loss or gain. However, if you place a bacterial cell in a hypotonic environment, we see that the amount of solutes inside the cell is higher, and that means that there's not a lot of water in there. So the water is going to rush into the cell. If the cell wall is damaged, maybe from an antibiotic or a lysozyme or something, that means that the pressure is going to burst the cell open, and that's referred to as osmotic lysis. It's one of the functions of that cell wall that we talked about previously is preventing that osmotic lysis. The idea that bacteria are going to go from various environments, sometimes they're in something that's a nice isotonic environment, but they could find themselves in a hypo or a hyper. So having a cell wall helps to prevent them from bursting when they get into these hypotonic environments, basically pure water. The cell wall isn't going to completely prevent the osmotic lysis. Obviously, if the pressure gets too high, that is going to burst it open. In a hypertonic environment, such as high salt or high sugar outside of the cell, that is going to cause the water to be pulled out of the cell, causing the cell to dehydrate. So as the water moves out of the cell, the cytoplasm begins to shrink and the plasma membrane starts to pull away from the cell wall. This is referred to as plasmolysis. So you can kind of see in the picture there, the shrinking away of the cell membrane from the cell wall. So this is going to be a condition that doesn't necessarily have to kill the cell. If it quickly gets back into physiological saline or something that's isotonic, it may be able to rehydrate. So it doesn't necessarily have to kill, but if you put things in high salt, high sugar, it definitely is going to inhibit the metabolism of the cell. In contrast, that hypotonic environment usually is going to be lethal to the cell. We'll talk more about that for bacterial cells in next week's lectures when we talk about bacterial growth and um, inhibition of that growth. But just a side note to say osmosis is also important in all cells, whether they be animal cells or plant cells. We see that animal cells do not usually have a cell wall of any type. And so they're going to be very susceptible to hypo and hypertonic environments. So with a hypotonic solution, water is going to rush in and burst that cell open. In isotonic, it's nice and happy. Amount of water coming in is equal to the amount of water going out. And in a hypertonic solution, high salt, high sugar, for the most part, the cell is going to be dehydrated.
Without the protection of the cell wall, animal cells are move, more likely to burst in a hypotonic environment and more likely to kind of shrivel and fold in on themselves in a hypertonic solution. Plants, on the other hand, they prefer a hypotonic environment. They rely on target pressure to remain upright. And so we see that if possible, they would like to be in a hypotonic solution where water is rushing into the cell and providing them that target pressure. In an isotonic environment, the plant cells actually become rather flaccid, and that's when you know it's time to water them. They start to get a little bit wilty. But the thing about plant cells is that they actually are pretty good about going back and forth between their environments. So in a hypertonic environment, even though the cell becomes plasmalized, the plasma membrane begins to shrink away from the plant cell wall, it still has attachments. And so that's why it's much easier for plant cells to kind of go back and forth in these environments, whereas for animal cells, unprotected by any type of a cell wall, they're going to be very susceptible to osmotic pressure. On that note, osmosis is important. So when we think about this, it's kind of an unusual to think that the New England Journal of Medicine had to report on a life-threatening complication that was caused by an ignorance of osmosis. So people that have liver damage or some liver abnormality, they may have trouble making enough albumin. So they may need a process referred to as plasmapheresis, where they get a volume of albumin. And usually this is a solution of 5% human albumin that's injected or infused into these individuals. Because if you're giving anything to people, you want to have it in physiological saline, so that 0.9% sodium chloride, so that it's isotonic. That makes sense. So what's the problem here? Well, like many things, we often buy something in a more concentrated form and then dilute it. So if a 5% solution wasn't available, the pharmacist had to use a 25% solution and dilute it. No problem, you take one part of the 25% solution and you put that with four parts of the diluent and you get that 5% solution. However, in several cases, it was being reported that the diluent used was sterile water, not physiological saline. So what's the problem? Well, you've just made a hypotonic environment and because you're giving a fairly large amount of this fluid, you're now causing all their cells to start bursting, and that could have been potentially life-threatening. So whether it's for our cells, whether it's for bacterial cells, osmosis is important. So what we've talked about so far is the passive movement across membranes. However, we're going to also see that there's active transport as well. So active transport requires a transporter protein similar to what we saw in that facilitated diffusion. But in this case, it's going to also require energy in the form of ATP. This is gonna occur because bacterial cells out in the environment often find themselves in an environment that is low in nutrients. Therefore, it's going to spend the energy to try to bring those nutrients in. Bacteria, also do a unique process referred to as group translocation. Group translocation occurs only in prokaryotes. So similar to what we just described in active transport, it requires a transporter protein, but instead of ATP, it's using a metabolic intermediate, PEP, phosphoenolpyruvic acid, to basically tag something like glucose once it gets across the membrane. So the substance is transported into the cell and then chemically altered, in this case phosphorylated, to become glucose 6-phosphate, and therefore it's a different substance. So it's no longer going to be setting up that concentration gradient, so therefore it can keep transporting in the glucose 
the sugar that it wants. So in the movement of materials across the membranes, we see that facilitated diffusion, active transport, and group translocation all require a transporter protein. But in facilitated diffusion, that is going to follow its natural concentration gradient from high to low. In active transport, this not only requires a transporter protein, it's going to use ATP to go against the concentration gradient. It's going to go against the gradient because even in a low nutrient environment, it wants to try to get whatever nutrients it can. Group translocation also uses that transporter protein, but here we see our, our PEP being converted into pyruvate allows the phosphorylation to modify the glucose so that again, it disrupts that concentration gradient so that the glucose now phosphorylated is going to stay inside the cell. So in summary, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion are passive processes. They are going to simply go down their concentration gradient from high to low. Active transport, on the other hand, is the only thing that can move a molecule against its concentration gradient. It's going to invest the energy because in a nutrient poor environment, it still wants to get those nutrients. And so therefore, that is the reason active transport, even though energetically costly, is still going to be utilized. I've posted a few videos from Khan Academy. Thank you, Khan Academy. If you're having some issues thinking about diffusion and transport, these are a good online resource to check out just for a little bit of added help if you feel that you need that. So we've talked about things external to the cell wall, and we've talked about the cell membrane, which is inside the cell wall. Now we're gonna talk about those things that truly are inside the cell. So looking at structures internal to the plasma membrane, the most obvious thing is going to be the nucleoid. That's the nuclear area where we're going to find the bacterial DNA. So that bacterial genome, just a reminder, is just one single bacterial circular chromosome. In the picture, it looks like this spaghetti mess, but that's actually one big circular chromosome that has just coiled up on itself. The bacterial genome has to contain all essential genes for a bacterial cell to be able to grow and, and metabolize. We'll also talk about other things. To the side of the cell there, you see the flattened circular plasmid. That's referred to as extra chromosomal because it's outside of the main bacterial genome. The rest of the area is this kind of jelly matrix of cytoplasm, and inside that you see these little circles, which are going to be ribosomes. So we'll talk about the plasmids first. Plasmids are small circular DNA, and as we just said, they're extra chromosomal, so they're outside of the main bacterial genome, and they contain non-essential genes. I refer to these as bonus genes because they're not part of the basic functioning of the cell to reproduce and function. However, they can be helpful in certain environments. We often see things like antibiotic resistant genes and virulence factors on these plasmids. So it's not essential, but if the bacteria finds itself in a antibiotic containing environment, obviously it would be a good bonus to have these genes. One of the misnomers is that when you see diagrams of plasmids, they often draw the cells as just having a couple of plasmids, when in reality, there's actually usually a very high copy number. That's why we use plasmids for biotechnology. They're very useful for cloning. We can take a human gene or other mammalian genes and insert them easily onto the plasmid. And because a bacterial cell like E. coli literally can have hundreds of these plasmids, you now have hundreds of copies of that gene 
and the bacteria replicates very quickly. So that's why these plasmids become very useful for cloning. In that cytoplasm, we said the little balls, these are all going to be the ribosomes. Ribosomes are the cytoprotein synthesis, both for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. When we talk about the rise of ribosome, we refer to its size based on buoyancy. So the ribosome has a small subunit and a large subunit. Those are always separate, but when you want to carry out protein synthesis, they then come together to make the complete ribosome. And if you saw a picture of protein synthesis, you would see the messenger RNA threading through in between the, the subunits. The units are referred to as Feedberg units because they're actually measuring buoyancy in a heavy gradient. So suffice it to say, it's mimicking the size, but it's not a weight the way we normally think of uh, measuring something. The other weird thing is that the individual subunits do not add up to the buoyancy of the complete ribosome. So the small subunit of a prokaryotic ribosome is 30S, the large subunit is 50S, but when you measure the buoyancy of the complete ribosome, it only measures at 70S. So that's why the math looks a little funky here. 30 plus the 50S makes a complete 70S ribosome. So we refer to the prokaryotic ribosome as being the 70S complete ribosome. So the 70S prokaryotic ribosome, as we'll see in a moment, is different in size and composition than a eukaryotic ribosome. That's why a number of antibiotics target protein synthesis. So you see things like gentamicin, which targets the small subunit, chloramphenicol and erythromycin that targets the large subunit. These are going to be selective toxicity because in theory, they should not harm the ribosomes of their eukaryotic host. So if we look at the difference in eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes, as we said, the prokaryotic ribosome those subunits are made up of proteins and RNA. The 70S ribosome for a prokaryote is the smaller 30S and the larger 50S subunit. For a eukaryote though, its units are 40 and 60S and the complete ribosome is 80S. So they have different proteins, different RNA, so that means that those antibiotics, in theory, are not going to harm the eukaryotic host. We'll see in a moment that there are some caveats to that because the antibiotics, if they get into the mitochondria, can actually do some harm. There are also inclusions within bacterial cells. Bacteria do not have membrane-bound organelles, so they can't use membrane-bound organelles to store various reserves. So these inclusions are actually just aggregates of various compounds that are normally involved mostly in energy reserved or being the building blocks of other cell molecules, but they are not within a membrane bound organelle. You can see them kind of looking like these holes or areas within the cell because these are going to accumulate when cells are grown in the presence of that excess nutrient. So here we see these inclusions of the polyhydroxybutyrate, which just means that it's carrying out lipid storage. It found itself in an environment where it was able to get lots of lipid, so it's going to store those up for a later use. So inclusions are going to be important in allowing the bacterial cell to have these reserves, so especially in the need for lipids and polysaccharides, those energy reserves can be quite important. The last of the structures that we're going to talk about that are inside the cell aren't found in every single cell. So endospores are these really tough resistant little cells or structures that allow for the survival of certain cells in adverse, under adverse conditions. The two genera that form endospores are Bacillus and Clostridium. 
Both of these are gram-positive rods, and you may have heard of things like Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax, and things like Clostridium tetani, the causative agent of tetanus. The problem with these organisms, the Bacillus anthracis, Bacillus is a aerobic gram-positive rod that likes oxygen, and Clostridium is an anaerobic gram-positive rod that doesn't grow in oxygen. But the problem is usually not so much the bacteria themselves out in the environment, it's their endospores. These endospores are formed within the cell, but if they are released, they are resistant to high temperatures, desiccation, most of our chemical disinfectants. Actually, in order to sterilize things to kill the endospores, you have to do something like autoclaving, where you provide high heat at 121 degrees Celsius and lots of pressure to, to force these endospores to explode. So these endospores are out in the environment all the time. In the panel over to the side, you can see the bacterial cells that have been stained purple since they're gram-positive rods, and inside they look like they have a hole that hasn't stained. That is actually the endospore. The endospore, because it has this resistant coating around it, does not allow the dye to permeate to stain the endospore. So these endospores are for survival. They can survive out in the environment for decades or longer. There's people that have recovered spores from amber and things like that. So this survival mechanism is meant for allowing the organism to survive adverse conditions, but it's not reproduction. The cell is going to form an endospore. That endospore gets put out in the environment but once it starts to germinate or come back to life, it only returns to make one vegetative living cell. So there's no increase in number, so it's not reproduction. Your book also talks about a, another organism that's kind of unfortunate that they put this with it, Coxiella brunetti, as having an endospore-like structure. It's not really an endospore. Coxiella is a gram-negative rod that causes a disease referred to as Q fever. We'll talk about Q fever later in the term, but it was one of the structures that set our pasteurization temperatures to make sure that we got rid of this organism because it's commonly found in unpasteurized dairy products. But true endospores, they are this genetic material inside with this really hard covering to the outside. As I said, in a gram stain, it's not going to stain the spore. So if we want to actually stain the spores, we have to do a special endospore staining procedure. In the lower right-hand panel, you see red vegetative cells and these green endospores that look like little green bees. In the endospore stain, you use a dye referred to as malachite green as the primary stain, and then that has to be heated into the cells and hence into the spores. The application of <clears throat> heat is referred to as the morting, so that is what's going to actually make it permeate into the spore, and then once there, it gets trapped inside. So to, to decolorize, you actually only need water. The water is going to wash out all of the dye from the vegetative cell, and then you're just left with the green endospores. Because you can't see a colorless vegetative cell, we then counterstain with saffronin, and this is going to give us a red vegetative cell and the green endospores. And that way we can easily visualize the endospores when we want to detect if they're present. In looking at the sporulation process, we see that the first thing that's going to happen is that the bacterial chromosome needs to be replicated. So once you have the newly replicated DNA, you're going to see the invagination or the pinching in of the cell membrane. This is going to surround the DNA, and then there's actually a spore sputum that is going to then isolate and forms another membrane around. So you end up getting these two membranes around the newly replicated DNA. 
the peptidoglycan is then going to fill in between. So you're basically putting a cell wall around the newly replicated DNA, and it's got these membranes, but that is not enough. You then actually put this really tough spore coat around it that's protein and other components, and that spore then is like an M&M or something, and it's really tough to the outside, that hard coating, and it is free and put out into the environment where it can survive very tough adverse conditions, and therefore the cell is going to go on to live another day. The rest of the chapter is about eukaryotic cells. However, I'm not going to test you on eukaryotic cells, but don't forget what you already know. So just for your own edification, make sure that you review. So take a look at some of the organelles. Eukaryotic cells have endoplasmic reticulums and Golgi apparatus and mitochondria and chloroplasts. So all the things that you already know about a eukaryotic cell are still important. However, our focus is going to be on comparison of prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells. So make sure that you look through that, understand the difference between the things like prokaryotes obviously do not have a nucleus, eukaryotes do. Other things about the ribosomes that we discussed, again, cell division for prokaryotes is binary fission, for eukaryotes is mitosis. So review things from the standpoint of comparison, but you will not be tested on the individual organelles from eukaryotes. I would like to say one last thing though about eukaryotes in relation to the evolution of eukaryotes in context of prokaryotes. So we believe that the most ancient of cells were ancestral prokaryotes. And we think that those prokaryotes then started to first in their evolutionary history to lead to the eukaryotic lineage, started to unfold their plasma membrane that would start to put a nuclear membrane around their DNA and start to potentially make some other membrane bound organelles. And we now have a theory on evolution that's referred to as the endosymbiotic theory pioneered by Lynn Margolis. Lynn Margolis was a leading evolutionary biologist, and she died in 2011, so um, not too long ago. But she was the main proponent that recognized where mitochondria and chloroplasts may have come from in relationship to other bacterial cells. So the theory says that larger bacterial prokaryotic cells started to engulf smaller bacterial cells and that this became a endosymbiotic relationship that eventually evolved into eukaryotic cells having mitochondria and chloroplasts. This makes sense because mitochondria started to become the powerhouse of the cell, so it was a good thing for a eukaryotic cell to be able to get more energy, and then eukaryotic cells went on their own evolutionary path to become, in most cases, multicellular. And photosynthetic organisms, again, utilize these photosynthetic bacteria to incorporate them as chloroplasts. We see the resemblance of the prokaryotic cells because mitochondria and chloroplasts, they can actually reproduce independently of their eukaryotic host cell. So you can make more mitochondria or more chloroplasts, they will reproduce even if the larger cell is not replicating. So this theory makes sense that some evolutionary precursor started to go down the various paths. And we see, again, those that were now going down that eukaryotic path, they started to invaginate their membranes to wall off the DNA. And it may seem unusual to think about the fact that you had these two endosymbiotic events. The first one where a primitive bacterial cell was engulfed to become the mitochondria, and that another event happened to give us chloroplasts. But phagocytic cells are very common. So cells do a lot of just taking up smaller things to try to obtain their nutrients. So this really isn't that weird of a concept. 
So once inside, these mitochondria started to replicate. So that's why when you have cells such as muscle cells that need lots of energy, they often have lots of mitochondria. So this became a beneficial relationship for that eukaryotic cell to be able to get more energy. And that's why we talk about the mitochondria as the powerhouse of the, the cell. Back to what we talked before about the ribosomes. This is part of the evidence for endosymbiosis of our prokaryotes giving rise to mitochondria and chloroplasts. If you look at a eukaryotic cell, again, their ribosomes are the ADS, and that is found as membrane-bound ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, and also free ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And if you look at a prokaryote, they have the 70S ribosomes, only free. They don't have membrane-bound organelles for them to attach to. But if you look at the chloroplast and mitochondria, they as well have 70S ribosomes. So they are their own little cells almost. They can no longer live outside of the larger eukaryotic cell, but they do replicate autogenously on their own. So that's it for our structure and function. The last several slides, these are concepts for you to be able to review, making sure that you understand the learning objectives of the chapter and outcomes. So thinking back to what we covered in part A and B, looking at the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, basic shapes, the various structures such as capsules, why they're important, flagella and fimbrae and pili, a lot of emphasis, we talked about the cell walls, looking at the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and why these are going to be good targets for antibiotics. We also talked about those atypical cell walls, so things like mycoplasms, so want to review that as well. And we also define things like protoplasts, furoplasts, and L-forms. So these are when you take away that cell wall. We looked at the membrane in some detail, looking at why we try to make agents that cause injury, but why it's probably not the best target and how things get across the membrane. The difference between diffusion and things like simple versus facilitated, what active transport is and group translocation, how are they sim similar, how are they different, and identifying the functions of those things inside the cell. So what are plasmids and inclusions? What are they for? And again, the, the purpose of endosporin. And then lastly, make sure you understand the comparison of structure and function between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and look at the evidence that support the endosymbiotic theory for eukaryotic evolution.